morning's scripture lesson is found in the prophecy of Ezekiel, chapter 37, starting with verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me around them, and behold, they were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, and they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came upon the, into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do this, declares the Lord. Our epistle lesson is found in the letter to Romans, chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. There is therefore no new condemnation from those who live in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin to death, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will raise Christ Jesus from the dead. Will also, he who get raised Christ Jesus from the, from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, through his spirit who dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the Lenten responsory. Holy 
Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and, his, and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was, was ill. So the sisters sent to, to him, saying, Lord, whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is good for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he had heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I must go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were there with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, 
Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I set this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his faith wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews there who had come with Mary and had seen what he did believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The place was Oklahoma City. The date, a little more than three years ago, March 11th, 2020. The time, 7.10 p.m. The announcer for the Oklahoma City Thunder, an NBA team, had just announced the starting lineups. The Thunder and the Utah Jazz were set to play. And then someone ran onto the court from all the way in the back of the arena with one job, to prevent the game from starting. The referees all huddled up, and the coaches were brought in near to hear the news. Jazz center Rudy Gobert had tested positive for COVID-19. And NBA Commissioner Adam Silver decided to cancel the game. This is the announcement that came over the loudspeaker. Fans, due to unforeseen circumstances, the game tonight has been postponed. Well, it was postponed at that point, right? Confused fans made their confusion and disappointment known as they prepared to leave the arena. The NBA was the first to cancel its season, then the NHL, then Major League Baseball and soccer, then college basketball. I have mixed feelings about that one because it did make the Virginia Cavaliers back-to-back -back national champions by a de facto situation because they didn't hold a tournament in 2020. The cancellations continued. High school sports, summer camps, pretty much all sports just shut down. In leadership, timing is everything, and nowhere is that clearer than when we look to our leaders to respond in a crisis. Every president, every governor, probably every mayor will have to face some kind of crisis during their time in office. And when that crisis comes, their constituents watch carefully to see not only what kind of solution their leaders have come up with, but how quickly those leaders respond and implement those plans. The pandemic was one such example. I'm sure you can think of many others. But in that case, leaders around the world scrambled to do something. The data were scarce, the solutions unclear, but people demanded that their leaders do something. And so they did the only thing they thought they could do at that time, and they shut everything down. It was right around three years ago that everything changed. Now, you may think that shutting everything down was the right call. You may think it was the wrong call. But what we can all agree on is that leaders everywhere, in politics, in education, in healthcare, in sports, and yes, also in the church, were under tremendous pressure to do something. And in some cases, it was less important to people that the something actually be effective than it was for the something to be implemented as quickly as possible. People were nervous, scared, and confused. Most people had never gone through anything like that before. And in moments of crisis, we look to our leaders 
the people we've put in positions of authority to have the answers. And not just to have the answers, but to implement those solutions as quickly as possible. Because the speed of their response is an indication to the people that their leaders actually care. To be perceived as slow and lazy in their response would be seen as uncaring apathy. In our gospel reading this morning from John chapter 11, we have ourselves a crisis. You may want to follow along with me in your bulletin. The crisis was this. Jesus' good friend Lazarus was terribly ill. Lazarus' sisters Mary and Martha sent someone to Jesus to tell him about it. In verse 3, so the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now I'd like to take a second to just reflect on that message and the way that it's crafted. Notice that the message wasn't, hey Jesus, Lazarus isn't feeling well. Instead they worded it, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now why word it that way? Surely Jesus would know that he loved Lazarus. Did he need to be reminded? Well, maybe he did. Maybe that was the point. Maybe the sisters wanted to remind Jesus of how much he loved Lazarus and how close they were. Maybe they phrased it this way in the hopes of getting his attention so that he would respond to this crisis as quickly as possible. Because surely Jesus cares, and if you care, you respond to the crisis as quickly as possible. But what was Jesus' response? Verse 4, But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Now I think it's safe to assume here that whatever messenger brought this message was probably taken aback at that response. That's not what we were expecting Jesus to say. We expected Jesus to drop what he was doing and rush back to Bethany. Instead, he says, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. And they probably headed right back to Mary and Martha with this message. And yet, as we look at the timing of this whole thing, this whole reading... It's entirely possible that by the time that messenger got to Jesus with the message, and certainly by the time the messenger got back to Mary and Martha with Jesus' response, Lazarus was already dead. Imagine Mary and Martha getting that news. The messenger comes back, and they say, Oh, did you get a hold of Jesus? Did you find him? What did he say? What's he going to do? Well... Jesus said that Lazarus' illness does not lead to death. Oh, well, he's, he's dead. He's been dead. Something's not quite right. Verses 5 and 6 tell us a lot here. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Anything seem off to you about those verses? Doesn't quite compute, does it? Jesus loved each of them and heard that Lazarus was ill. And so he decided to stay where he was for two more days. Hmm. Do you think anyone involved in this situation felt that that was the right call for Jesus to make? What did that slow response communicate? And yet that's what he did. Now is that how we would expect our loved ones to respond or react upon hearing that we're terribly ill? To stay put for another two days? And yet Jesus has his reasons. We can only assume so much here, but it's entirely possible, as I said, that Lazarus was already dead on the day when Jesus received the message about his illness. And he would have known that even if no one else did. And then the other part of this, as we look further down in the text, is spoken by Jesus in verse 14. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, 
And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Much like we saw with the man born blind, Jesus says that this, too, is an affliction through which the glory of God will be revealed and displayed. And in fact, he does answer their prayer. He does answer their call for help. But not in the way and on the timeline that they were asking for. Jesus says that Lazarus' death was actually going to be a benefit to the disciples to strengthen their faith because they would get to see the kingdom of God come near to them when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Now it's worth noting that the trip Jesus made with his disciples was a dangerous one. The disciples were clearly concerned about Jesus being killed by some of the leaders. Bethany, where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived, was right outside Jerusalem. And so in a sense, Jesus and his disciples are going to head back into enemy territory after barely escaping with their lives. And we see this with Thomas' words in verse 16. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So they made the trip. And when they arrived, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb. And he'd been dead for four days. And when Mary and Martha heard that Jesus was back in town, Martha went to see Jesus, but Mary stayed at home, seated in her home. There were lots of mourners and people from the community who'd come out to support them in their grief. And what were the first words Martha said when she caught up with Jesus in verse 21? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Those are words of accusation. This is a woman in grief, but also a woman of great faith. Because the very next words she spoke were, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. To which Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Now, Martha thought Jesus was talking about a resurrection far in the future, the one that we talk about where the last trumpet sounds and the dead are raised and are sent to final judgment. But Jesus was actually talking about the very near future. And Martha made a great confession of her faith in verse 27. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Martha's problem was one that all of us have. She was grieving. She was confronted with death in a very personal way. And when she put her dear brother Lazarus in the tomb, she believed that the time for anyone's intervention, the time for anyone's help, was over. She thought that Jesus could have helped him if he'd gotten there in time, but since he didn't respond to the crisis quickly enough, there was nothing left to be done. Lazarus was dead, and that window was closed. Yet in the midst of all her anger and grief and disappointment, there was a spark of hope. Hope that God would hear Jesus' prayer and hope that her brother would indeed rise again. Now as the text goes on, we see that Jesus also spoke to Mary after Martha went and got her. And what were Mary's first words to Jesus? This is in verse 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, what? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The same accusation her sister made. Yet another accusation made in grief. Something any one of us could cry out in the midst of so much pain. Lord, where were you? Lord, don't you care? Lord, weren't you paying attention? Lord, don't you love me? Lord, if you had been here like you said you would, this wouldn't have happened. So where were you? He's been dead four days. The tomb stinks to high heaven. You being here now may be too little, too late. Was Jesus' slow response proof that he didn't love Lazarus? Or his sisters? 
The shortest verse in the Bible would disagree. Verse 35, Jesus wept. He was deeply moved. He grieved. He missed his friend. He felt the pain that Lazarus' family and friends were going through. And yet, listen to the accusations made against Jesus. Look at verse 37. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Because in all of their minds, the preservation of Lazarus' life would have been the ultimate good. The fact that Jesus allowed Lazarus to die was an indictment against Jesus. And they thought that his slow response to this crisis was evidence that he either didn't really care or that he didn't have the power to do anything about it. But what they didn't know, what they couldn't see, was that Jesus actually had something even better in store for Lazarus. He prayed to his father, and then in verse 43, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him. So not only was Lazarus restored to life, but all the onlookers and anyone they went and told about this later got to witness God in action. Healing the sick is a wonderful thing. We pray for healing. Jesus is the great physician. He hears and answers our prayers. Yet many times when we find ourselves in the midst of a crisis, like Lazarus' sisters did, we look to our leader Jesus for a quick response. And if we don't get the answer or the response we want on the timing we want, we might be tempted to believe that he doesn't love us or that he doesn't care. But we must always remember that even when our physical bodies aren't healed in the way or on the timeline that we pray for, Christ has something even better in store for us. A resurrection. The day when God will raise our perishable temporary bodies to something eternal and glorious without the stain of sin or the stench of death. It's not a band-aid over death or a temporary fix. Jesus is the cure to death itself. And so, my friends, when you are faced with a crisis, as you inevitably will, be patient. Don't get sucked into the thinking that says, if God doesn't immediately do what you want him to do, that he doesn't care or that he doesn't love you. Because trust me, he does. He loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus, his only begotten son, to die on the cross of Calvary for you. Would not a God who gave up his own son for you love you enough to hear your prayers and answer them? Of course. And anyone telling us otherwise is not from above, but from below. He will answer all those prayers in his own time and in his own way and grant us joy and peace beyond what we could even imagine or ask for. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.